big welcome to International Christian Center Mombasa and I know that you've been here because you have been uh, following along with the worship and uh, the announcements and everything else and even the giving um, and so for me to say a big welcome is just uh, an affirmation that uh, indeed this uh, is a place that uh, you can come and we can connect together even as uh, we get to share the word of God. We have been in a sermon series here at ICC Mombasa entitled Hearing God and uh, we've been looking at the word of God and asking does God still speak in this day and age? And what we've been realizing, what we've been affirming from the word of God is that our God still speaks. Our God still gives insight and wisdom and direction to his people and I'm I'm so excited because on this third Sunday of the month of October, I am bringing us installment number five. This is Hearing God week number five. And so I take the opportunity to welcome us here all. And I believe that as we share the word of God today, we are going to be built up, edified and encouraged. And I mentioned to somebody and I said that today's someone is actually not a preaching this is a teaching and i need you to get your notebooks and pens out and i need you to invite your friends and just tell them hey let's talk about this let's be able to study together in the word of god my name is edward monene and it's such a privilege and an honor for me to be sharing the word of god with us today and i am speaking let me just say it outright so that you're ready i am speaking on hearing god through the prophetic voice through the prophetic voice. On the first Sunday of this sermon series, we talked about how God spoke to the early church through five different ways. And the first one was through the apostolic teaching. And we've been able to establish that apostolic teaching really was based on the word of God. And then we talked about how God spoke through his Holy Spirit uh, to the disciples. And then we talked about last week how God spoke uh, to the disciples, um, you know, how he spoke to them through dreams and visions and uh, today we dig into the word of god and we look at uh, how god spoke to the early church through the prophetic voice through the prophetic voice i know anytime you mention the prophetic there are those people who become very opposed and they say no no, no I, <laughs> I i i don't want to listen to that you know the god has spoken in these last days through his son jesus christ and that is found in the word of god because jesus is the word of god and i don't want to hear anything else and i agree the canon of scripture is closed. When we talk about the prophetic or the prophetic voice or prophecy or prophets in our day, we are not saying that we are going to add to the word of God. What we are saying though is that God speaks and gives his people guidance and direction and insight on what to do, how to deal with issues. And uh, let me not get ahead of myself. We are going to deal with all that. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer that uh, you may speak to us today as we dig into your word. May we understand, may it speak to us. May we be transformed and changed by the same and especially on this important topic in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Allow me to ask you the question. When you, are, when you hear somebody is prophesying, or somebody gave a prophetic word, or somebody has a prophecy, how do you normally respond? Because there are several responses that uh, we begin to see how people respond to the whole issue of prophecy and the prophetic. And today, um, allow me to say that uh, this sermon is so crucial because we are talking about something that is very important, hearing God through prophets, prophetic words, and prophecy. Now, you may be asking, Pastor, do we need to go there? Do we really need to go there? Why is this topic so essential? Is it important? Should we even be discussing it today? Because sometimes prophecy and the prophetic and prophets make us uncomfortable. But we need to be able to dig into this. And uh, I'll begin, I'll begin with the laying the groundwork using the word of God, because really what we are doing is a study through the scripture. And as I've told you today, I came to teach, not necessarily to preach, you know, three points and, and, and I'm gone. Um, and you will see that uh, we have got quite a bit of uh, substance to cover here. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 20, the Bible says, the Apostle Paul writing, he says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. 
And so the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And I know that there are people who talk about this foundational structure right here. And they say that, uh, you know, the apostles and the prophets, these were the, the original, uh, you know, 12 uh, apostles of, of uh, Jesus Christ. And, um, and and the prophets that were there in those days, that uh, that's what established the church. And once that was done, we do not have apostles and prophets in our day. And uh, I will not get into that debate for today but allow me to say that uh, when you look at this and you see that prophets are uh, a foundational structure to the early church then uh, listening to the prophetic voice then is no longer optional or peripheral but it's at the central or you know of um, just the center of anything that the church does the center of the functioning of the church of Jesus Christ in this age of information that we are in, in this age that uh, we live in, there is, uh, uh, allow me to say, there is an overload of information, for example, and uh, the spread of uh, j just information and knowledge and all that. And we are constantly bombarded by an array of voices. Take uh, a moment right now and just think about it. I, you know, uh, what, what are the sources of information that uh, you have with you and sources of communication that you have with you? Let me just give you a quick example. Beginning with a mobile phone, you have text messages, you have calls. You know, somebody can call you right now as you're listening to me. There's WhatsApp, there's Twitter, or, or, or uh, is it X? <laughs> there's Instagram, there's threads, there's Facebook, you know, and, and I can go on and on. I have not even mentioned, <laughs> I've not even mentioned, uh, you know, some of the others that are out there. And I know you, you're already beginning to tell me, hey, why, why aren't you talking about TikTok? What am I saying? That there's such an, an overload of information and communication. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're wondering if uh, I will continue, there's YouTube and there's access to emails, there's uh, media, you know, TV and all that. There's people's opinion. And if I may add, there's also self proclaimed prophets in this day and age. And with all this, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to understand. Uh, you know, what is it that we ought to do? What is it that we need to pursue? You hear 22 voices at the same time. How do you respond? <laughs> and amidst this din and noise and everything that is going on, allow me to say this is precisely why we need to be able to understand the role of genuine prophets and prophetic words so that we can be able to you know use this as spiritual tuning fork to help us tune to the frequency of heaven hear the voice of god and walk in the way that god would desire for us to walk in we live in a day and age where you can literally get onto youtube and find five different people speaking about the same scripture and they leave you confused and you're wondering what what do i understand out of this you can get onto facebook right now or you can get onto youtube right now or tiktok and end up confused because of the voices that are there and so the prophetic is very important in this day and age while we live in a day where some can argue that prophecy was a feature of a bygone era that that, that generation is gone that there is no longer prophecy allow me to say scripture tells us something completely different. The New Testament itself bears evidence that uh, prophecy and the prophetic have continued or continued well beyond the Old Testament and into the Gentile church, you know, from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the Gentile church. And I'd like you to turn together with me to the Bible so that we can be able to read this. In the book of First Corinthians, chapter number 14, I'll read verse number 1 to verse number 3. First Corinthians, chapter 14, verse number 1 to 3. The Bible says, uh, this is an encouragement to all of us. It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And so the scripture is telling us, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, for their encouraging, and their comfort. And allow me to say, if the Bible advocates for it, we must engage with it. I have friends who believe in what is called the cessation uh, theology. 
they believe that uh, the age of the prophets and uh, the, the apostles is gone. They believe that signs and wonders and miracles, that generation is gone. And that they say that in this day and age, we have to remain faithful to scripture. You know, sola scriptura. We have to be faithful to scripture and scripture only and nothing else. And I respect many of them. In fact, when we sit down and we discuss and we talk, uh, we agree on a lot of things. And, uh, and especially, we agree that the canon of scripture is closed. That uh, we are not going to get a new book. We are not going to get, uh, you know, Acts uh, 2, uh, you know, or the second uh, act. We are not going to get, uh, you know, the, the book of Mombasarinians or, or something like that. You know, I believe that the word of God is not going to be added to. That is sealed and that is closed. But I allow me to say, we differ on the fact that uh, we, I believe, and I am a, th that's who I am, and uh, that's who we are as a church, ICC Mombasa. We are continuationists. Who are continuationists? We believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are still present today. We believe that the Holy Spirit is still at work today. We believe that God still works miracles, signs, and wonders. We believe that prophecy is still there. And the ministry of the Spirit of God is still there, building the church, equipping the church, empowering the church, and helping us to be able to do all that God desires. And I believe from this text right here, there is nowhere, and, and by the way, I've said this before, and allow me to repeat it again. There is nowhere in scripture where the Bible says that there will come a day that gifts will cease. And if you read uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, because that's where a lot of uh, cessation is used, it says that, that uh, prophecies will cease and or, or the gifts will cease and all that. But it actually, when you read it in context, it talks about this ceasing when Jesus Christ returns. And Jesus has not returned. We are still building the church. He's still building his church. And he said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the voice of the Spirit of God is needed in this day and age so that the church can be strengthened, so that the church can be encouraged, and so that the church can be comforted. That's what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 3. But let me go back to verse number 1. Verse number 1 says, Pursue love. And every one of us agrees that that's a very important thing to do even today, that we need to pursue love. But allow me to pause right here and ask, why would God then tell us to pursue love and uh, to desire spiritual gifts and especially the gift of prophecy and then turn around and cause desire, you know, these spiritual gifts to cease, cause prophecy to cease and remain with love, pursue love. Why, why would he do that? It's one verse. It's not divided. It's not segmented. It simply says pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And so the Bible is telling me to pursue love and to desire spiritual gifts and especially the gift of prophecy. Why? Because prophecy builds. Prophecy inspires. Prophecy lifts. Prophecy causes the church of Jesus to be the church that it ought to be. And therefore in a generation of so much information, Prophecy begins to give insight and direction and wisdom to the body of Christ because it strengthens, it encourages, and it comforts. That's what prophecy does. And I'd like to just pause right here, uh, you know, and say that those three things, by the way, I normally tell people, if somebody gives you a prophetic word and it does not line up with those three things, you need to look them straight in the eye and tell them, you know, I don't think that is God speaking. You know, for example, somebody coming to you and they look at you and they tell you, well, I dreamt with you, I dreamt that you are dead or I dreamt your daughter was dead and uh, then they w walk away and uh, when you're asking them, what do you mean? They tell you, well, I dreamt that uh, my grandfather was dead and my grandfather died and I dreamt my, my cousin was dead and my cousin died. What are they telling you? They, 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 they are not strengthening you. They are not encouraging you. They are not comforting you. And many times, Allow me to say this with all humility. Many times that's not the voice of God. Many times that's not the voice of God. And let's continue here. You see, <laughs> the Bible is calling us to a place of desiring and seeking after prophecy. That we may be able to prophesy. You see, prophecy is not just about foretelling the future events. Prophecy is also forth-telling 
And those are the two uh, purposes or two meanings of uh, prophecy. Prophecy is about foretelling the future, but it's also about foretelling, speaking forth the wisdom, the revelation, and the instruction of the word of God. Being able to say, here is what the word of God says. And, and so allow me to j just look at that scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 3. What I've just done right here in telling you that sp prophecy is supposed to strengthen, encourage, and comfort. And how you should respond when, when somebody comes and give you, gives you this scary you know, prophecy, so to say. What I've just done right there, that's prophecy. Because I've told you, I've fought told the word of God I told you how to speak you know and how to walk according to the word of God and so a lot of proper teaching and equipping and the building of the church through the word of God is actually prophecy because you are forth telling the truth of the word of God and so prophecy is a very vital tool for both personal spiritual growth and the well-being of the church prophecy is very important for personal spiritual growth and the well-being of the church. Why? Because prophecy foretells the future, but prophecy also, uh, you know, speaks forth the wisdom of God's word, the revelation, the instructions, you know, and the direction so that we can be able to know what to do and how to live according to the word of God. And this is so needed in this present day. Because if you and I are going to live for God, here at ICC Mombasa and in the community of faith, wherever you find yourself, allow me to say it's so important to walk in the prophetic. It's so important if you're going to thrive, if you're going to become who God desires of us, if you're going to accomplish the things that God wants us to accomplish, then we've got to be a people that are prophetic. Church, we are living in very complex and turbulent times. Whether we talk about the moral decay in society, the social injustices that we witness every day, the wars and the rumors of wars, the personal trials that each one of us faces, never before has there been a more pressing need for divine guidance and the voice of God than in this day that we are living in. We need the admonishing, we need the encouragement, we need the building, we need the inspiring of the Spirit of God. And how? And where will we get this if we reject and deny the prophetic or the prophet or, or the, the whole aspect of prophecy and prophets? How do we deal with corruption? How do we deal with the challenges of uh, the economic times that we find ourselves in? How do we survive and be able to still move forward when uh, there are all kinds of voices coming against us? I said to us, the prophetic voice will always serve as a spiritual compass that will help us navigate through the storms of life towards God's purpose, towards God's will, towards God's peace that is available for us. And so we dig deeper into the word of God here. And as we do so, let me invite you to open your mind and be eager to receive what I'm sharing with us today, and not just what I'm sharing with us today, but to be able to receive the word of God when prophets and prophetic words and even prophecies come our way. Let's position ourselves not just to hear, but also to heed. For in doing so, we align ourselves with God's will, and uh, this sets the stage for God's kingdom to manifest itself here on earth. I want to talk about prophets and prophecy in the New Testament. Prophets and prophecy in the New Testament. And as I told you, today I am teaching. And so if you could uh, you know, put that as a, as a subheading of everything that we are talking about. Prophets and prophecy in the New Testament. Because I've just done the intro. Alright? <laughs> the New Testament didn't put an end to the prophetic voice. It has expanded it. Or rather, it expanded it because it was a prophetic voice in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we find that this was not done away with. But rather, it was actually expanded. Because, uh, you know, we, we find prophets in the New Testament. But we also find people who are not necessarily called prophets who prophesied. And, and there's that uh, difference right here. And I'm going to show you in the scriptures that I want to quote. Um, one of the people that uh, the Bible calls a prophet is found in the book of Acts chapter 11 verse number 27 uh, to verse number 30 and I'd like to uh, go ahead and read that scripture in the book of Acts um, you know in the book of Acts chapter 11 uh, if you'd uh, just stand in there together with me let me read this uh, for us Acts chapter 11 
let's see this prophet that uh, we are talking about in the scripture the bible says in verse number 27 acts 11 verse number 27 during this time some prophets came down from jerusalem to antioch one of them named agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire world this happened during the reign of claudius the disciples as each one was able decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in judea this they did sending their gift to the elders by barnabas and saul and so we find a man here that the bible calls a prophet in fact the bible says uh, during this time some prophets so he wasn't the only one he was in the company of other prophets he was in the company of other prophets and this is a new testament by the way this is not in kings this is in, in the new testament prophets come down from jerusalem and one of those prophets was called agabus and the bible is very clear about this let's go somewhere else acts chapter 21 acts chapter 21 i want to show us uh you know a different uh uh, let me go ahead and uh, show us the difference between prophets and prophecy uh, because I told you, I promised that uh, I would do that. Prophets uh, and prophecy. What's the difference? Acts 21, here is what the Bible says. Acts 21, here is what the Bible says. Um, I want to read from verse number 7. Acts 21, verse number 7. The Bible says, We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached uh, Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. And so the Bible doesn't call them prophets. It doesn't say the daughters of Philip were prophets. It simply says they prophesied. Bible says they prophesied and let me show you there's actually a difference verse number 10 after we had been there a number of days a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and so Agabus is no, is marked as a prophet but the daughters of uh, Philip are said to be daughters that prophesied and so you begin to see that we have prophets and we have prophecies and if you were careful uh, listening to me as uh, I was talking about my sermon, I also talked about prophetic words. I also talked about prophetic words. And uh, what are prophetic words is when, uh, you know, somebody, for example, a, a pastor or, a, a, you know, s just a believer gives a prophetic word in the midst of a speech or something that they're saying that is not necessarily, they're not prophesying necessarily, uh, but, but uh, they, they give a prophetic word in there they there's something that that god picks out and, and comes out and uh but having j just differentiated and showed you that there were prophets and prophecy in the new testament let's continue here i want to talk about the importance of heeding prophetic voices what's the importance of heeding prophetic voices is it important should we heed prophetic voices now we are already at acts chapter 21 and i want to read a few more verses in there and then i'll go and read acts chapter 22 verse number 17 uh, to 21 and i want to show you some things in there on the importance of heeding the prophetic word and i want to begin by looking at the apostle paul now many times uh those of you who are part of icc mombasa maybe one time or another you've heard me talk about the the, the apostle paul and uh, criticized not really criticized but people say that i love criticizing the apostle paul but it's not really criticizing him he's a man that did a great work i respect and honor the apostle paul i love reading the, the letters that paul wrote which are part of the bible and um and they edify they build you know it's a word of god and the word of god is uh, you know sharper than any two-edged sword it penetrates deep to the dividing line of soul and spirit of joints and marrow judging the desires and thoughts of our hearts but here is the thing. There was a time when the Apostle Paul ignored prophecy. There was a time the Apostle Paul 
did not walk according to the prophetic word that he had been given. There was a time the Apostle Paul did not walk in obedience to the instruction. But I'm avoiding using the word obedience for today. I'm just simply saying he did not heed. He did not walk according to it. He did not do what he was being told to do. Listen to this. Acts chapter 21. Let's go ahead and read this. I'd like to begin from verse number 1. Um, and uh, just read a chunk of verses. I'll read until verse number 6 because I already read from verse number 7 all the way to verse number 10 and then I'll continue to from verse number 11 uh, to verse number 14. Just bear with me. Here is what the Bible says. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to course. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia went on board and set sail after sighting cyprus and passing to the south of it we sailed to syria we landed at tyre where our ship was to unload its cargo verse 4 we sought out the disciples there and stayed with them seven days through the spirit through the spirit they urged paul not to go on to jerusalem they urged paul through the spirit they urged uh, saul not to go on uh, to Jerusalem of Paul not to go on to Jerusalem verse 5 when it was time to leave we left and continued our way all of them including wives and children accompanied us out of the city and there on the beach we knelt and prayed after saying goodbye to each other we went aboard the ship and they returned home Verse number 7 says we continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais where we greeted the brothers and sisters and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day we reached Caesarea and stayed on in the house of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven, who had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Verse 10, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, The Holy Spirit says... In this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Verse 12, when we heard this, we, that means Luke and the rest of the co-workers of Paul, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. And allow me to stop right here and say, uh -uh, there was no the Lord's will be done here. The Apostle Paul was simply refusing to heed the prophetic voice. Why do I say that? And why do I love saying this? Because... It, it, I use it as a lesson to myself and to people. And remember what we're talking about. The importance of heeding the voice of the Holy Spirit through the prophetic. The importance. And, and what I'm showing us in scripture is that the Apostle Paul did not heed to the prophetic voice. And so Acts chapter 22 verse number 17. Acts 22 verse number 17. The Apostle Paul has been arrested and uh, these guys almost killed him. And here is what he stands as a way of defending himself. Here is what he stands and says. Verse number 17. When I returned to Jerusalem when I was praying, he's giving a testimony. He's talking about the, the time before when he was in Jerusalem, what had happened. And the Bible says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and I saw the Lord speaking to me. Jesus speaking to him. Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. Verse 19, Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And I pause right here and I ask, why was the Apostle Paul obsessed with coming back to Jerusalem. Jesus told him, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. But the Apostle Paul is like, no, 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 I'm going back there. No, I'm going back there. I, I'm, I'm just going back there. Why? Why? Apostle Paul, why are you insisting on going back to Jerusalem? The Lord sent you away. The Holy Spirit is saying, don't go. Why are you going? Why are you going? But you see, friends, it's so easy 
to proceed nonetheless to do the things that we want to do regardless of what we hear uh, you know from a prophet or a prophecy or prophetic word it's it's so easy and so the apostle paul confesses that jesus sent him far away but he insisted on coming paul should not have been a prisoner he should not have ended up as a prisoner in fact, I was having this discussion, uh, in, you know, this past week with, with uh, somebody. And, uh, I, you know, we were talking about this and uh, they, they were of the opinion that uh, the Apostle Paul went to Jerusalem because the, the Holy Spirit led him. And I said, no, no, no. I am of the opinion that the Apostle Paul was disobeying the prophetic voice. And in our discussion, um, in our discussion, I told the person, I believe the Apostle Paul would have done so much more ministry if he did not go up, you know, to Jerusalem. For example, look at the letter he wrote to the, look at the letters he wrote when he was not in prison. Those letters, you know, are detailed. For example, Romans, they are so detailed and uh, have so much information. And the same applies to the letters to the Corinthians. Uh, but, but the letter to the Ephesians, very powerful letter, and the letter to the Philippians, very powerful letters. But you find that they are short. They, you know, he's writing, he's finishing, he's just uh, picking on the key things and moving on. There's so much more ministry would have done, so many other places that you would have preached the gospel. But he ignored the prophetic. He ignored the prophetic. Allow me to say the prophetic word serves as a warning serves as uh, divine counsel, serves as uh, God's instructions. And when we ignore the prophetic word, just like Paul, we will move on with life and it may not appear as though it, it's disastrous, but we'll have failed to accomplish everything that God meant for us. I wonder why the Apostle Paul ignored Agabus when it was his own personal prophecy, but he was quick to obey on a different prophecy that Agabus gave. We read from the book of uh, Acts chapter 11, when uh, Agabus gave a prophecy about the famine that was coming on uh, the, the, the whole world then, the Roman world. W what did they do? Apostle Paul, together with Barnabas, who are the people that were sent with money, what had been given, they were sent with it to take it to Judea. He did not question, he did not argue. He believed that the, this was a prophet of God, and he did. The Bible says, one of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. And this is found in Acts 11 verse 28. Agabus prophesied and what he prophesied was acted upon, not just by Paul, not just by Barnabas, but the whole church. The whole church responded. The Bible says the disciples, each one was able, uh, which one, uh, each one, as was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. They did this, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. In other words, they did not panic. The church did not panic. The church was not worried. The church did not hold resources. You know, the way we respond in this day and age when we hear something is going to happen and people go to the supermarket and they buy even tissue paper, they clear the shelves of everything. Do you remember the COVID uh, season? You know, people do panic by the disciple the believers here did not panic they walked in obedience to the prophecy that was given and the apostle paul was one of them and this demonstrated a faith that was not stagnant but a faith that was activated by the prophetic word that was given to them in fact let me just pause here because we are talking about we are contrasting how paul responded in heeding the voice of the holy spirit through the prophetic and how the church responded and so out of this, let me give us five things, five ways to correctly heed prophecy. Five ways to correctly respond to prophecy. Are you ready? Let me give it, uh, give it to us. Number one, an immediate, there needs to be immediate acknowledgement. When a prophecy is given, there needs to be immediate acknowledgement. The early church, they did not disregard the prophecy. They took it seriously. They sat down and they were able to quickly say, this is what we are going to do. What, why did they do that? They acknowledged the prophecy. They acknowledged that a prophecy had been given. And I believe that in the acknowledging, there was also the testing and confirming this is actually a prophecy from God. This is actually a prophecy from God. 
and they went ahead and acted on it. They did not wait for the famine to begin in order for them to gather together and say, you know, we were given a prophecy by Agabus. No, no, no. They actually acknowledged it. In fact, when I was preparing these notes for today, one of the things that I told, uh, you know, I prayed about is to simply say, God, forgive us for the times when you've given us prophecies at ICC Mombasa and we do not sit together to acknowledge the prophecy and to be able to do the other things that I want to talk about. And so any time a prophecy is given, it's important to be able to, uh, you know, it's important for there to be immediate acknowledgement. And the immediate acknowledgement, as I've said, is where even the issues of testing the prophecy and confirming that it's from God should happen. Number two, there needs to be corporate deliberation. There needs to be corporate deliberation coming together, um, you know, coming together and saying, this is what we are going to do. It wasn't a single individual in this church who responded. It was a collective decision by the disciples and they decided to send help to the church in Judea. When a prophecy is given, especially one that impacts a community or a church, there should be corporate response. There needs to be a coming together and a saying, here is how we move together. And that's why I've told you, you know, I prayed about this and I told the Lord, forgive us for the times that we've not done this when you've given us prophetic words. That Because there needs to be, number one, immediate acknowledgement. Number two, there needs to be corporate deliberation. Third thing that uh, this uh, church did, third thing they did, there was strategic action. They took strategic action. The disciples assessed their individual abilities and how they were going to contribute each person according to their own ability. They did not act rashly. You know, they, they were not forced to give. They were not manipulated in giving. No, no, no. They actually planned and each one was able to give and these resources were collected wisely and then there was number four sensible execution there was strategic action and then number four there was sensible execution they sent their gift to the elders to the elders they did not they did not try to establish a base in uh, judea where they would be sending the help they, did, they they knew we need to send this to the church in jerusalem and we need to tell them what it is for we need to explain the prophecy that has been given they also were careful to send this by the hand of barnabas and saul who are respected leaders in the church why they were ensuring that there was proper accountability and managing of the resources and this shows the importance of entrusting the task you know anytime we are responding to a, uh, to a prophetic word that uh, there needs to be an entrusting of the task to capable hands for effective execution you know in order for there to be proper prophetic response and so sensible execution what do we see for so far? Immediate acknowledgement. Number two, corporate deliberation. Number three, strategic action. Number four, sensible execution. Number five, alignment with scripture. There was alignment, uh, alignment uh, to scripture in everything they did. For example, their actions exemplified what the word of God teaches when it comes to loving others, when it comes to sharing, when it comes to giving. The Bible says, give and shall come back to you. Good measure, press down, shaken together, running, running over. The Bible says that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so we see a people that are stepping out to obey scripture. We see a people that are stepping out to love others. The Bible says that we need to do that. Pursue love. We read that at the beginning pursue love and so we see them doing these things and i say to us every time there is a prophecy uh, a prophecy given to a church a community of believers there needs to be immediate acknowledgement there needs to be corporate deliberation there needs to be strategic action there needs to be sensible execution and there needs to be alignment to scripture alignment to the bible when it comes to you as an individual as an individual there's a prophecy that you have received either god has spoken to you you know prophetically through a prophet or a prophecy that was given somewhere here is what you do there needs to be immediate acknowledgement there needs to be deliberation personal deliberation asking yourself you know questions in regard to what you be or has been shared number three there needs to be action you need to take action strategic action number four there needs to be sensible execution just coming and saying this is what god has spoken to me this is what uh, i've been told and uh, this is how i'm going to move forward and number five there needs to always be alignment to scripture there always needs to be alignment alignment to scripture you cannot respond to prophecy 
you know, without alignment to scripture, what do I mean? Somebody gives a prophetic word and says that, um, you know, God is going to entrust you with wealth and you're going to have resources so that you can be able to do ministry. And then you pick a gun and you walk into a bank to go rob the bank because you're saying God has given me money. Or because somebody gave you a prophetic word that God is going to give you a printing business. For example, you decide, you know what, I am going to take over somebody's printing business. I will do, you know, there has to be. You can't steal and then say it was a prophetic word. That that's not right. That's not proper. You cannot manipulate. You cannot con people. You cannot walk in corruption and say you're fulfilling prophetic word. That's, that, that's not possible. There has to be alignment to scripture. In summary, Agabus prophecy and the ensuing action of the early church provide us with a template on how to rep respond to prophetic words. The Apostle Paul should have done this. He did not acknowledge what people were saying. He did not <laughs> acknowledge what the people were telling him. There was no deliberation of sitting back and saying, hey, as much as I feel compelled to go to Jerusalem, but wh why am I hearing this? Because in the deliberation, there should have been prayer. There should have been consulting. There should have been asking questions. Even when his own friends, the co-workers he was with, Luke and the others, began to beseech him not to go, he should have listened. He should have said, okay, can I consult God on this? Can we pray about this? But Paul did not do any one of those. There was no deliberation. And there was no strategic action to respond to the prophecy. He just decided to continue on doing what he had purposed what he had done. And allow me to say there was no sensible execution. He arrives in Jerusalem. He is told by the elders in Jerusalem. The people here do not believe that you are doing the right thing. The people here think that you have been doing the wrong thing. And what does the Apostle Paul decide? He says, I will go into the temple. I will ask a few people to go with me. I'm going to be shaved and I'm going to take up an oath. And when the people surround him and there's a riot in Jerusalem, Paul still wants to go out and speak to the people again. There was no sensible execution. Because remember, he had completely ignored the prophecy that he had been given. And so we continue here. The example of this church and how they responded to the prophecy of Agabus gives us the correct response how we need to acknowledge, how we need to make the decision, how we need to move forward with strategic action, and how there needs to be responsible execution and alignment to be biblical principles. When we do this, we ensure that we don't just hear God's prophetic word, but that we take action that brings honor and praise and glory to the living God, that there is a strengthening of the body of Christ. Now, why is the prophetic voice needed today? I told you today I'm teaching <laughs> and, and I've given you several subheadings here. Why is a prophetic voice needed today? You see, the prophetic voice in today's church acts as a divine tool for guidance, confirmation, awakening, correction, and unity. Whenever we receive a prophetic word, it's crucial to test it to pray over it, to seek wise counsel, and finally to take action. By doing this, we ensure that we are not only hearing God's voice, but we are walking in complete obedience to his divine instructions. We are doing what God desires of us. If we neglect the voice of God in this day and age, when we come to the place where we begin to ignore and to leave as though there is no prophecy and, and, and prophecy is gone, we will not be able to know what it is to do on a daily basis. What has God called us to do? What are the things that God wants us to walk in? And allow me to say that prophecy is not for personal, uh, uh, for, for personal exaltation. You begin to feel as though you are better than other people. I've seen ministers of the gospel do that, where they begin to walk around. And, and this actually might be the reason why so many people are opposed, where you begin to walk around as though you are the mightiest of the mighty and no one can correct you no one can tell you you know something no one can take you back to the word of God and tell you this is not true even when people give words that are not genuine that are not true that do not come to pass there is no humility of being able to say I was wrong in that instance and this is what is right this is what I should have done I believe that prophecy and the prophetic voice in our day has to be submitted to the word of God because you cannot prophesy and say things that are not consistent with the word of God. Our generation needs the prophetic voice. Yes, 
and our generation needs to understand that the voice of the spirit through the pro through prophecy is for guidance is for confirmation is for awakening is for correction it's for bringing unity and building unity and therefore we need to be willing to submit whatever prophecy we have to the crucial test of prophecy because the bible tells us to test prophecy we should pray over it we should seek wise counsel and finally we should take action when the prophecy is from god what should we do when we receive a prophetic word if, if the prophecy and prophetic word is needed today what should we do when we receive a prophetic word you see the practice of testing prophecy is not mere, merely uh, something discretionary that uh, we decide for ourselves it is a biblical imperative and i use that word uh, you know to simply say prophecy is a biblical imperative the testing of prophecy the bible tells us to do so the apostle paul explicitly says it in first thessalonians chapter 5 verse number 20 and 21 the bible says do not treat prophecies with contempt and I believe that's a warning every person needs to hear. Those who believe that prophecy is not for our day and those who believe in prophecies, everyone should hear this. Don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Test the prophecies. Hold on to what is good. Hold on to what is good. This exhortation safeguards the integrity of the prophetic ministry and ensures that the church remains aligned to God's will and God's word. And I believe that uh, we, we are in danger in this generation of coming to the place where we are beginning to treat prophecies with contempt because there have been too many people that have not been willing to test or to allow the prophecies to be tested. It's okay to test prophecy. It's okay to test prophecy. And if the prophecy is found not to be true or not to be right, it's important for that prophet to be able or, or that the person who gave the prophecy or the person who gave the prophetic word to come to the place of saying I was wrong I didn't listen properly and, and that can happen because prophecy and prophetic words in our day is not infallible the word of God is infallible but prophecy prophetic words and the prophets when they speak are infallible they can be wrong it's possible to prophet, it's possible to be led by the Spirit of God, but you didn't take time to listen. Or you allowed yourself to be led by your own desires and longings. I remember, I remember in, uh, during the last elections of the United States of America, there were so many voices that were prophesying about uh, Donald Trump and how he would win the election. And the, the prophecies were going on and I was not even thinking about it. I was not praying about it. And I went to bed, um, you know, here in Kenya, I, I went to bed and at about 1 a.m. in the night thereabouts, I woke up. God woke me up. I can say that with confidence. God woke me up and I had a burden to pray for the United States of America. I was in bed and I, and I went all the way to the sitting room and I knelt at a seat where I used to kneel and I began to pray. And as I was there, I had God speak to me very clearly that Donald Trump was not going to win the election of the United States of America. And I wrote it on Facebook and it's there even today with a timestamp when, when I was writing that the elections in the United States of America were still ongoing. And I wrote that. But the reason for bringing this up is not to talk about the prophecy and what God spoke to me, but, but in terms of uh, who would win the election, but uh, is to say something that God told me that shook me. He said, my servants have refused to do what I wanted them to do, to disciple this man when he was in leadership. Why? Did they fail to disciple Donald Trump? Be be because that's what God told me. Um, because of political inclinations. Because of our own desires. For example, we are living in a day and age where the church of Jesus Christ, and what I'm about to say can get me into trouble, where the church of Jesus, for example, cannot even be able to pray for Palestine, uh, the, the Palestinians and Palestine. Because we are so, uh, we, we think that uh, praying for the peace of Jerusalem means condoning whatever it is that the nation of Israel does. But allow me to say this. Somebody needs to say they are wrong. They cannot kill and maim and destroy lives. And I know the Palestinians are doing the same and it's not right. We need to stop being, you know, people who take sides. 
you know, you're Republicans or you're Democrats. We need to stop taking sides. I support Israel or I support Palestine. We need to stop taking sides where you begin to say, uh, you know, coming back to the nation of Kenya, I support ODM or I support anyone opposed to ODM. No, no, no. Those things need to be put aside because if you're going to hear the voice of the Lord and walk in the, that which God desires, then you cannot be a man or a woman that takes sides. Because our God is not going to take political sides. Our God is not going to take part. God has his own sight. Ask Joshua when he was standing near the city of Jericho. And the angel or, or uh, the commander of the Lord's army showed up. Joshua asked him, are you for us or for our enemies? And he answered and said, neither. Neither. Even though the Israelites were going to conquer Jericho, the commander of the Lord's army said, Neither, I am here as commander of the army of the Lord. I have come to do the will of God. And every prophecy, every prophetic word, every uh, prophet needs to stay aligned to the will of God, not the will of man, not the opinion of people. And so the Bible says, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them. Test them. And ensure that, that you're not taking sides. Hold on to what is good. Does that mean that uh, it's possible for a prophecy to actually not have what is good? <laughs> Let's continue here. This exhortation safeguards the integrity of the prophetic ministry. It ensures that uh, the prophetic ministry is not brought to shame. ICC Mombasa, it is important to test prophecy and the testing actually serves multiple purposes. The, the, you know, when you test prophecy, there are certain things that you do. And I'd like to give you three of them. When you test prophecy, what purpose does it serve? If you're with me, let's, uh, let me give you three of them. Testing prophecy, number one, testing prophecy validates its source. Testing prophecy validates itself. It ensures that the prophecy truly originated from God and not from human imagination or even other darker sources. Because there can be other darker sources when you're not listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so testing prophecy ensures that the prophecy is coming from God and it, has, it, it doesn't have human origination. Or it, it's, it's not coming from a place of imagination. Because it's possible for me to imagine things. It's possible for friends to imagine things. It's possible. And so we have to ensure that we test prophecy to validate its source. First John chapter 4 verse number 1 actually tells us this. And I'd like to uh, go ahead and read the scripture for us. First John uh, chapter number 4. If you're just standing there, let me read the scripture for us. So that uh, we can be able to get what we are talking about in this uh, 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 context and so here we go um, let me read this for us first John chapter 4 verse number 1 the Bible says dear friends do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many fa false prophets have gone out into the world many false prophets even in the days of the Apostle John there are many prophets uh, you know false prophets in the days of uh, Paul and Peter there are many false prophets and the Bible is saying test test the spirit so that you can know whether the, the, that prophecy is from the Lord. And so it's important to do that. Test pro prophecy to validate its source. Number two, uh, this is the reason why we test prophecy. Number two, testing prophecy confirms consistency to scripture. When you test a prophecy, it confirms whether that prophecy is consistent with scripture. It's important to ensure that we are people that stay grounded in scripture. We stay grounded to the word of God. We are believing, we are walking in what, that which the Bible tells us to. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so we stay true to all scripture that is God breathed. We, we've got to ensure we do that. Making sure that prophecy aligns with biblical doctrine and the teaching of, of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is very important. And so number one, testing uh, prophecy validates its source. Number two, testing prophecy confirms consistency to scripture. Number three, number three, testing prophecy ensures spiritual accountability. Testing prophecy 
ensures spiritual accountability because there needs to be spiritual accountability. We cannot be a people that uh, just uh, run around, do whatever we want, and no one can be able to hold us accountable. It doesn't matter who the man or the woman is. Every one of us, myself included, needs to be accountable. Listen to this. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 29. The Bible says two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what was said. Two or three prophets. This is an a chat service. And I will read a few verses around this one in just a moment. Two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And allow me to also just add a caveat here and say, Paul is telling the Corinthian church, this church that, that was in the city of Corinth, these Gentiles that were so sinful, some of them, when they came to faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says actually in chapter 9, some of them used to be homosexuals, some of them uh, used to be liars and thieves and drunkards and all that. You know, they came to faith in Jesus Christ and now Paul is saying among them, they're actually prophets. And the prophets are not few. There are many. The Bible is saying two or three prophets should speak when the church is gathered. When the church is gathered. But in order for these prophets to be able to continue to grow and to walk in the grace of God and to be able to serve God's purposes and accomplish His will, there has to be accountability. Testing prophecy ensures spiritual accountability. Holding prophets and prophetic words and prophecy to testing ensures a culture of account accountability and responsibility in the church. For those God uses, they have to ensure that what they proclaim, what they say, they, they are checks and balances to ensure that they are uh, you know, speaking what God is saying and they are benefiting the community of faith. So, my friends, as we come towards concluding our teaching for today allow me to give us three ways to test prophecy because you've said it's important to test prophecy and i've given you three things that happen when we test prophecy how do we test prophecy number one we've got to examine prophecy against scripture all scripture needs to be tested against uh, or all prophecy needs to be tested against scripture examine it against scripture this is the most important, crucial test of any prophecy, prophetic word, or prophet. Measure what they say against the word of God. Because the word of God is infallible. The prophet's prophecy and prophetic words are infallible. Uh, I mean, the, the word of God is infallible, but prophets, prophetic words and prophecy uh, are fallible. They, they, the, the word of God is infallible. But what they say, what the prophets say, what the prophecy is given is infallible. The Bible says all scripture, and I read this scripture before, all scripture is God breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. And so the word of God is true. The word of God does not lie. The word of God does not need correction. The word of God is forever settled. But the prophecy that I give, the prophecy another person gives, the, uh, the, the prophetic word, the, the prophet we are all infallible. We are all infallible. No true prophecy will ever contradict the Bible. No true prophecy will ever contradict the Bible. Any prophetic word that deviates from biblical truth or promotes heresy must be rejected outright. Can I repeat that again? Any prophetic word that deviates from biblical truth or promotes heresy must be rejected outright. And, and case closed. That's it. The Bereans set a commendable example for us in Acts 17, verse number 11. They diligently examined the scriptures to verify the teachings that they were receiving. And so number one, examine prophecy against scripture. Number two, seek the confirmation of spiritually mature believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse 29, Paul advises, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. This involves communal discernment. Being able to sit and ask, is this a word from the Lord? Is this what God is saying? And they're able to check it against scripture and they're able to look at it and what uh, the goal is. Uh, you know, they're able to pray together. They're able to hear the voice of God and they're able to ascertain. It's important to confirm, uh, you know, prophecy. It's important to confirm prophecy. It's advisable to consult with those who 
uh, you know, have walked with the Lord, with pastors and church leaders who are well versed in scripture and filled with the Holy Spirit. Their wisdom and spiritual insight is invaluable in determining the authenticity and relevance of a prophetic message. It's very important. It's very important. Number three, number three, assess the fruit and outcome. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 7, verse number 16 to 18, by their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. The fulfillment of a prophetic word is a strong indicator of its divine origin. But it's not just uh, you know, the fulfillment, but what fruit has come out of it. What fruit has come out of it? Does the prophecy lead to edification, exhortation, and comfort? Remember 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 3. That does, uh, it, does a prophecy edify? Does it exhort? That is, does it comfort? The words I used was, does it, uh, you know, what did I say? Does it, en- does it strengthen? Does it encourage? Does it comfort? Because if it doesn't do that, then you need to say this is not correct. Because when you give a prophetic word and it causes people to be so afraid, it causes people to not even be able to pray, it causes people to be discouraged, it causes people to walk away from the faith, then I doubt the place where that prophecy came from. For example, when I was in campus many years ago, there was this gentleman who claimed he was a prophet and uh, he could give prophetic words. And uh, one day we are walking from the library, we're going towards our halls of residence uh, in the evening, and we meet with this gentleman that that was walking with another lady, and they were born again, they were, uh, you know, classmates of ours, and uh, this gentleman walks up to them, he was from a different class, and uh, he stops the, the gentleman, and he gives him, in quotes, a word from the Lord. And he tells him he's been sinning and uh, God has been seeing him and uh, God is going to, uh, you know, bring fire and judgment against him because he's been rebellious. And then he walked away. And as he walked away, this gentleman was so shocked. And uh, rather than be encouraged to seek God and to walk in the ways of God, this guy literally walked away from the faith. The accusation from this brother, because I I pursued him and just asked, hey, by the way, what what was that about? Uh, His accusation was this gentleman and that lady had been sleeping together. He said that's what God had showed him. But the truth is, because these were my classmates and I, uh, you know, and I sat down with them and and followed them and tried to reach out to them, was they (laughs) they came from the same estate back in in uh, in Nairobi they were living they, they came from the same estate they knew each other even before they came to campus and that's why most times they, they'll be seen together and then they were classmates but each one of them had a relationship you know in campus they had relationship outside of campus with other people in their churches and so there was nothing like that going on but this gentleman got so discouraged so disappointed so angry that literally he walked away from the faith and so my, my friend who claimed that he had a prophetic word from God. Number one, he lied because God did not show him that. There was no sin between these two. Number two, this gentleman was not walking in sin. This was an accusation that was labeled. And what did he do? It ended up pushing him away from God. And so the fruit had nothing to do with God. That was a spirit of arrogance. It was an arrogant spirit that thought and and you know it, it would take upon itself to to give prophetic words that are not from god and in this day and age we have seen this happen a lot you know people giving words that condemn that accuse that 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 push people away from god rather than draw them away and uh, draw them closer and it's the reason why a lot of people do not like prophecy and prophet anything to do with the prophetic it's not right if a if a prophecy does not strengthen does not encourage does not comfort i question where it's coming from and that's the word of god first corinthians chapter 14 verse number three does that word does it draw people closer to god and align them with his will does it promote love joy peace patience gu- kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control which are the fruit of the spirit if it's not doing that then you need to be able to uh, question it and say hold on hold on You see, testing prophecy is not a sign of disbelief or a lack of faith. On the contrary, it demonstrates a mature, responsible approach. 
to one of the church's most powerful gifts because prophecy and prophets and prophetic words are very a very powerful gift in the body of Christ. And so when you test prophecy, you're really ensuring that, uh, you know, that, that God's word is honored, that God is glorified, that we are walking in the things that God desires of us to walk in. Now, I'd like to just say to us, when you employ these three uh, methods or, or these three uh, pronged approach to testing uh, prophecy, then you're able to help the church align to scripture, walk in that which God wants them to walk in and accomplish the things that God would want us to accomplish. We ensure that uh, prophetic ministry is serving God's intended purpose. We are doing the things that God would want us to do. Now, as I bring our sermon today to a close, allow me to finally, finally talk about how to become a prophetic church. And I'm going to conclude this very quickly because I have three points and I am done. How do we become a prophetic church? Number one, we must desire the gift of the Spirit and especially the gift of prophecy. I already read this scripture for us uh, from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 1. The Bible says that we need uh, to pursue love and uh, desire spiritual gifts and especially the gift of prophecy. That, that's what scripture calls us to. That's what scripture calls us to. We need to desire prophecy. It's important to desire the gifts of the spirit and especially prophecy. That's important. If you are going to become a prophetic judge, that is very important. What's your desire? What is it that you desire? What is it that you long for? What is it that you want to see God do in your church, in your life, in your community? Desire spiritual gifts and especially the gift of prophecy. Number two, we must seek to strengthen encourage and bring comfort to others i know it's very easy to, to want to condemn it's so easy to want to accuse it's so easy to want to cast but listen to me that's not the purpose of the prophecy prophecy seeks to strengthen to encourage and to bring comfort and if you're going to become a prophetic people of a, or, or a prophetic church we must seek to strengthen we must seek to encourage and we must seek to bring comfort to others the Bible says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, chapter 14, verse number 3. And finally, number 3, we must cultivate an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. We must cultivate an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, verse 26. I'd like to read this for us and then we'll bring this to a close. Because a prophetic church is a spirit-filled church. And we must set aside our agendas, our traditions, our way of doing things and give space for the Holy Spirit to move. We should then you know, ensure that we are a church that brings honor and glory to God as we seek to walk and live in an atmosphere uh, you know, of, of the Holy Spirit. When we come together in our services at ICC Mombasa, here is what we should do. Here is what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when we come together, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. We are not gathering together for self-gratification. We are not gathering together for our agenda. We are coming together to honor and glorify Christ. And so verse number 26, uh, let me read verse number 27. The Bible says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or, or at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Verse 29, two or three prophets should speak and the other should weigh carefully what is said. What are we talking about? You create room. You create room for the operation of the Holy Spirit. You create an atmosphere or you ensure that there is an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. We must cultivate an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit. And I hope you remember how it began. It began by a hymn by a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. There is a focus to hear. There is a focus to hear. My family, allow me to say the prophetic voice is not outdated. Neither did it cease. God is still speaking. And we need to yearn for prophecy. We need to cultivate the atmosphere of the Holy Spirit and be ready and committed to be accountable for the prophecy to be tested. 
as we do this, we will hear God's voice and we will walk in alignment with his will and guidance in our day. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. May the Holy Spirit be with you. May he guide you and cause you to be a prophetic person. And may we be a prophetic church. Desire spiritual gifts and especially the gift of prophecy. Heavenly Father, it's my prayer that you will cause us as a church to be a prophetic people who walk according to your leading, in your guidance, doing the things that you desire. Would you cause the voice of prophecy and prophetic words be, Lord, that which we walk in as a congregation? Would you raise prophets in our midst? We read, Lord, in the, in the church at uh, Corinth, there were prophets. That's why the Apostle Paul is writing and saying two uh, prophets should speak, two or three prophets should speak. Lord, I pray for prophets in our midst. May we hear your voice. May we walk in your purpose. May we do the things that you desire. May we bring honor and glory and praise to your holy name. It's my prayer, Lord, that you will take a hold of us and you help us to hear your voice and walk in obedience to your leading. May our lives be different. May our cities be different. May our families be different because of your voice. And so, Lord, speak to us and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you are praying, allow me to say... Being able to walk in the prophetic begins at the place where there is submission to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, that must, must be the first thing that you do. You come to the place of saying, Jesus, I give you my life, that you may be my Lord and my leader, and begin to live your life according to the teaching of the Word of God, submitted to Jesus Christ. Having said that, I invite all of us, all of us, to go ahead and say, Jesus, lead me build me and help me. May God bless you so much. Thank you for being here. Have a beautiful and amazing rest of the day. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we wrap up and bring this sermon to a close. God be with you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.